Cobb, gruesome and horrifying, ghastly, of pertaining to dealing with or representing death, especially its grimmer or uglier aspect, of or suggestive of the allegorical dance of death. Prepare yourself for these macabre moments. Welcome, everybody, to the May episode of Macabre Moments. How are you doing, Corey? I'm well. I'm well. How are you? I'm really excited for tonight's guest. I'm super duper duper excited. Um, He is the founder and director of the Pennsylvania Cryptozoology Society, former director of the PA Bigfoot Society, field researcher for the BFRO, um host of beyond the edge radio podcast and my personal crypto sabe i'd like to welcome eric altman to the show yay (laughs) eric thank you so much for taking the time to be on macabre moments once again we have come full circle did you like my little kermit the frog yay i I was picturing kermit the frog when you said that when you did that i was flailing my arms around and everything (laughs) Maybe send us, can you do it again after the show and send us a video for the promo? No, that's okay. Oh, damn. <laughs> Just picture it in already, your head. Already I'm disappointed. So, yeah, um, back in the day when I was just doing Macabre Moments uh, solo, I had Eric on as a guest. And then uh, he, at the time, he was ho- host of Beyond the Edge Radio. Um, if, uh, I'd say, what, a year after I had you on as, as a guest... You had a competition for the co-host for Beyond the Edge. Um, And then this is where Kari comes in, because Mm -hmm. Kari was one of my biggest fans of Macabre Moments, and she voted a thousand plus times for me (laughs) to be the co-host for Beyond the Edge. I messaged Um, Eric every single day. So, I, yeah, Eric and I, uh, uh, we we hosted Beyond the Edge together for almost four years. Um, And then uh, I went off to do Paradivas with Marianne Donnelly, which, who I also stole from Beyond the Edge. (laughs) Oh, this is so funny to me. I'm so... (laughs) And and then um, I ended up having Kari. I wanted to give... um, I wanted to do what Eric did for me, right? Like, Eric... um, Without Eric giving me that co-host position on uh be on the edge i wouldn't i don't think i would still be doing this today um and so going forward with paradivas and then and bringing back macabre moments i wanted to do for kari what eric did for me um and so i brought kari on to be my co-host for for paradivas and then to to uh uh bring back macabre moments so um that's what i mean uh, when I say I, it's full circle, because it truly is full circle, right? Like, I interv- I interviewed you initially, like, six years ago, Eric. Wow. It's been that long. On Macabre Moments, yeah. Hmm. I know. Actually, I, I remember that interview because it was, I was doing a, a conference that weekend in, um, I think it was Charleroi, Pennsylvania, and we went to dinner with a bunch of the speakers and I actually, we were going to um, Cracker Barrel for dinner, and I actually left dinner. Um, I didn't have dinner that night because I had forgotten that you and I had a radio interview. So I drove home and did the interview with you, and then I went back and met the rest of the guys and just kind of hung out that night. So I remember that very well. I didn't know that you... He starved for you. He starved right? to give you an interview. You made, you made a, such a sacrifice for... Sacrifice. You're, so, um, you're the yeah, best. I'm... I'm that kind of a guy. What can I say? <laughs> you truly are. You, I mean, you, you're, and you're so humble too, which I love. Um, eh. Stop it. It's all about me. It's, well, it should be because you, you're the crypto sabe. Oh, that's true. Right. So yeah, what, well, yeah. What's been? What's new with you? What's going on in the in the world of Eric Altman these days? Uh, nothing. I'm just kind of laying here on the couch this evening talking to you two ladies. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an exciting life, let me tell you. <laughs> well, I mean, I saw you that you're having some um, issues with your back. Yeah, um, as many people know, and as you you know, Marie, um, the reason I, I stopped doing um, 
beyond the edge radios, I needed to take a break from my health. Um, dealing with like chronic pain every day and I found out I have uh, severe rheumatoid arthritis and I just found out uh, Thursday I think it was or Friday whenever I have my orthopedic doctor appointment that it's now in my neck so I'm probably gonna have to have uh, an infusion done on the discs in my the back of my neck so yeah oh yeah well maybe is there any chance that you could not have to have that surgery Oh, yeah, I, I can not. It, it's elective surgery. I mean, it'll help with the pain, but they say it does more damage than it does good. So I'm going to hold off and just get a bunch of like really cool drugs. There you and go. Just take them and just feel good all the time and not have to worry about it. That's not a bad yeah, plan. Drugs are basically the answer for everything. Yeah, they are. They're pretty good. Okay. No, kids, don't listen I'm to these kidding. two. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm sorry to hear that, Eric. I hope you feel better soon. And if you do decide to get the surgery, I hope it helps. Um, you know, there's not much you can... It's not like people will say, oh, you have back problems? Do yoga. Yeah, it doesn't really work like that for <laughs> discs that need to be fused. So I'm really sorry to hear that. That's really painful. It's, it's, yeah, it's, thanks. Um, it's really not much I can do to, to no. correct it. No. No. Um, People that don't know what RA is, it's an autoimmune disease where your white blood cells um, think that your healthy tissue and healthy joints are actually a virus or an infection, so they attack it. Yeah. And they, they break down your joints, they break down the cartilage, and eventually you, know, you, you can't use your joints because there's no cartilage or any, anything left. All you have is fluids, and it becomes quite painful. And uh, yeah, sitting is really difficult for ex extended periods of time. That's why I decided to uh, put BTE radio on hold for a while. And then we tried launching it for a couple episodes and I got through those couple episodes and it was just like, uh, I can't do this. It's just not right now anyways. Hopefully, um, I just started a new medication. So hopefully when that begins to kick in and, and starts the inflammation from being so bad that I can start doing normal things again because I miss going out in the woods and hiking and investigating cases and, and just doing normal things around the house. Yeah, and glucosamine will help as well with your joint health. Um, yep. <clears throat> I, I so I know I, I give it to my horse actually because uh, he's an ex barrel racer, so he's got um, you know joint problems and and age and you know all those great things that make you break down. But that's kind of a segue into our next subject. So Eric is a uh, cryptid researcher. And um, for those who don't know what that is, Marie, do you want to tell them? Uh, Eric could, would be the best one to tell them, I think. Eric, <laughs> okay. what, 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 Eric? Is a, what is a cryptid? Well, uh, cryptozoology is the study of animals or, well, yeah, zoology, as we know, is the study of animals. Mm -hmm. uh, crypto comes from the Greek word cryptos, which means hidden or unknown. So you put the two words together, it's basically the study of unknown or, or hidden animals. Animals that have not yet been recognized by science or cataloged or categorized. So um, animals such as like the chupacabra, the mothman, thunderbirds, um, Bigfoot, if you will. Um, different Loch Ness cryptos. Monster. Yeah, Loch Ness Monster, some of these variety of lake monsters and, and sea monsters uh, are called cryptids because they're thought not to exist because science doesn't recognize them as real animals. But a cryptozoologist really isn't a person who has a degree in zoology who studies hidden animals. It's just a term that was made up by a biologist in 1958. Uh, Bernard Heuvelman was his name. And he was he basically put the word out there, we, we need to study these animals and prove to science that they real they are real, the, the real animals, they do exist. And um, it's, it's kind of a label that's been given to people like myself that um, research and study these these undiscovered animals. And we tried to, as amateur scientists, um, we tried to prove that they're real or at least gather enough evidence for the scientific community to look at these animals seriously and for them to start studying. What's cool about it is um, after so many years of doing this, we're getting more and more accredited scientists, primatologists, anthropologists, archaeologists, um, and even zoologists involved in actually studying the phenomenon. And there's there's many wildlife bio biologists as well getting involved or have um, stepped out into the forefront 
to say, yes, we are studying this phenomenon and we think it deserves a, a closer look at. So the work of the armchair or amateur researchers finally paid off and we're starting to get the scientific community to start looking into the phenomenon. You know what blows me away about cryptids <clears throat> is that every single continent on this earth has a myth or a legend about a cryptid. Yeah, um, that that's true. Um, whether or not they are legitimate, uh, they're based on truth or, or based on a legitimate animal that may or may not exist. Um, some of them are folklore, some of them are tribal uh, legends and lore passed down through history. Uh, some have history that date way back to biblical times. So yes, you're right, there, there are a lot of continents that have uh, a cryptid in one form or another, and some have actually been proven to exist. So that's kind of cool too. Um, the only problem with that is um, not all these continents um, have actually proven these cryptids to be real. So it remains a creature of what's to most people have, have called it uh, myth or legend or, or fairy tales, if you will. So yeah, it's, it's cool that there, there are a lot of different co countries and continents that have their, their cryptids and their stories. But it's sad, though, that a lot of them remain nothing but stories. And, and that's where the scientists and the research come in. Right. Yeah, for those who are, who are trying to prove that these cryptids are real, that, that's where they, they step in and, and, and do the best they can with what limited material, little, limited time and, and resources they have. So your focal point for your cryptozoology is Bigfoot, though. Can you, can you tell us a bit about that and why? Why Bigfoot? Well, I, I've always been a fan of, of cryptids since I was young. I was a big, big time fan of sci-fi movies, horror movies, um, a fan of different types of monsters, the monster movies especially. Mm -hmm. And when I was about 10 or 11 years old, there was a film that, that was shown on one of our local uh, TV stations here in, in the Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania area. It was called Legend of Boggy Creek. Oh, yeah, I remember that movie. Yeah, and it's, it's a... a I call it a docudrama because it's a fictional film that's based on real events that took place in a small town in Ar southern Arkansas called Falk, Arkansas, where the supposed upright hair-covered creature terrorized the residents of the town and it, it stalked um, different wildlife and, and farm animals and, and killed uh, farmers' pigs and goats and sheep. And, and there were many people that had um, sightings of the creature or experiences. And they did a kind of what, what what do you see now on these these TV shows that you see the reenactments? That's what this film did. It was made in 1972 by Charles Pierce, mm -hmm. released on the big screen, went through the drive-in circuit, and then eventually le released to uh, some of the local channels when they would play their sci-fi movies and stuff. And that got me kind of interested in the subject. And I thought, man, if this thing really happened in Falk, Arkansas, I wonder what the chances are of this ha thing happening around the country in different little towns and, and different little states and in different locations. And I went to my public library and found out, sure enough, that here in Pennsylvania, there were uh, sightings of a Bigfoot-like creature seen dating way, way back into the 1930s. And um, I was really surprised to find out in my hometown of Greensburg, Pennsylvania, during the, the early 1970s, 73 and 74 specifically, there was a, a huge flap of Bigfoot sightings and encounters that took place. And some of them were actually within miles of my home. So I, I found that extremely fascinating. And I went, began to, I wanted to learn more about Bigfoot itself and if it was real or not. So I began reading books and magazines and newspaper articles and watching the TV documentaries as, as much as I could um, and, and studying it. And sure enough, I found out there was a researcher named Stan Gordon, who was researching those reports from the 70s, and he lived in my hometown. And uh, I saw in the newspaper one day he was going to be putting on a UFO and Bigfoot display at our local mall. Uh, I pestered my parents to take me out to the mall and drop me off, which they did. And I ended up spending the entire weekend at the mall just going over all his, all his documentation, his information, looking at casts that he made, pictures that he had taken, and just fell in love with the subject, um, got to know Stan very well. Uh, we, that's where we first formed our friendship. We've been friends now for, gosh, about uh, 40 years almost. Oh, wow. And uh, he became my mentor 
and um, I really started following all his work. And at the time, he was pretty much the predominant Bigfoot researcher in Pennsylvania. He, uh, Dr. Paul Johnson, there was a handful of others that were doing research in PA. And uh, I just started following their work. And finally, in 1997, um, after I got married, moved back to Pennsylvania from Ohio, I decided, man, this is a good time for me. I'm, you know, have an apartment, have a job, wife. Good time for me to start looking into the subject myself and seeing if there's any validity to it. And sure enough, that's that's what I did. I started going out and, and looking at the historical areas that I'd read about, and because I wanted to see them for myself, what they look like, and try to get a, a an idea in my head, you know, perhaps what the place looked like when the person experienced it, to maybe kind of walk in their shoes, if you will, and and understand what they were experiencing. And uh, from there, I, I just started investigating cases. I became involved with the BFRO um, in 99 I went on to form, well, it was already formed, but I wanted to join the, the Pennsylvania Bigfoot Society. In 2000, I was asked to take over the group as its director. Uh, I was the director of it up until 2014 and I uh, left the group then and formed my own group called the Pennsylvania Cryptozoology Society. It's a broader look at more cryptids than just Bigfoot. So that's what I've been doing the last uh, 30 40, 39, 40 years. So this has been a lifelong passion. Um, yeah, I, I, if you want to call it a passion, um, I call it uh, personal suicide, but you know, oh. <laughs> you have your choice. Why do you call it that? Well, if, if you really think about it, I mean, yeah, it's cool that, that I spent 40 years looking into the phenomenon, but I spent thousands of dollars of my own money investing in equipment and traveling around the country, specifically the East Coast, um, studying the phenomenon, um, spending so much time away from the family and, and involved in le speaking, le lecturing at conferences and speaking at events. And, and just, I put so much personal time into it, so much money into it, um, so much passion into it. Here I am 40 years later with nothing more to show than 40 years of research and investigation. So a lot of people call it personal suicide because it's p basically what it is. I mean, you're just, you're giving up your life to look into a subject that may or may not exist. I don't know. I don't think that's a bad thing to chase. Well, you know? I, I, I could say, honestly, if, if I had more definitive proof that, that Bigfoot was real and does exist, then I'd be a little more um, optimistic about the research I've done. But here I am 40 years later with nothing more to show than when I first started. So it's been an interesting journey and it's been a rabbit, uh, a rabbit hole full of twists and turns um, with some really strange directions I've gone in. But I, I've met some fantastic people over the years. I've made some wonderful friendships. Um, I've had some pretty interesting experiences and encounters. And <clears throat> um, yeah, it's, it's, been, uh, it's been different. Let's put it that way. It's been different. I, well, what, I, go ahead, Marie. Oh, I was just going to say, I... I, I, I... I, I see, I can empathize with Eric and where he's coming from because, you know, I've been into the paranormal since I was a kid and I feel the same way. Like I've been into, you know, doing this for about 40 years and it's like it, it, personal suicide, right? Like I get that, that, um, description because, um, I, you know, it, it, if, I do have anything to show for it. It is nothing positive. <laughs> it, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, it, it's only been, you know, a negative, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking act activity for lack of a better description that, that I, I'm, I'm actually getting. So why it's, you know, I guess it's a double edged sword might be a, a way to put it. I don't know. What do you think, Eric? Yeah, I, I think you, I think that might be a better way to put it as a double-edged sword because it's got some good points to it where you do, get, you do get the chance to meet a lot of wonderful and amazing people and you get to spend a lot of time outdoors and, and uh, in, in nature and, and see things that you wouldn't normally see behind your, your TV or your computer screen. So, I mean, that, that aspect of it's great. I've gotten to travel and to speak to thousands of people um, I've done hundreds of events. I've investigated almost 300 cases, uh, Bigfoot cases across Pennsylvania and the surrounding states. So, I mean, that's the positive side of it. 
the negative side is not only do you get to meet good people, but you run into your share of negative people. Mm. Um, you run into your share of negative experiences like, like you have Marie. Mm -hmm. um, it's not, it's not all bells and whistles and, and you know, um, rainbows and ponies. Uh, it's, it's got its dark side too. Um, but you know, I, I've enjoyed it for the most part of what I've done and you know, I just keep pushing forward. Uh, I, I'll tell you what, if looking back on 40 years, if I could tell myself back then saying, you know, Hey, change this, I would have told myself, Hey, don't waste your money on all this unnecessary equipment. <laughs> yeah. Cause it's not gonna, it's not gonna get you anything other than playing with some cool gadgets for a while until the next cool thing comes out. So, yeah. I mean, it's been a learning experience and I'm grateful for that. But um, I, th I think uh, after 40 years of doing this, I think I could have spent my, my time and, and energy and money on something probably more constructive. <laughs> well, so, so I, go ahead. Wh what is your most impressive investigation or slash experience in the Bigfoot world? Well, um, out of the 20, uh, 97 to now, what's what that? 23 years of field investigations and actually going out there and, and spending time in the woods proactively as well as reactively for cases. Um, I, I've had a lot of strange and unusual experiences that I can't explain. Uh, I can't say they were Bigfoot because I did not see what was responsible for the scream or yell or what left the footprints or what did the wood knocking or the rock throwing. So I, I can't def definitively oh, say that was a Bigfoot, you know, but um, I've had a lot of really cool experiences in the outdoors, both normal um, and unnormal. Um, there, there's some things that I've experienced. I, I don't have one in particular that really stands out, unfortunately, because they've all been unique and interesting in their own way. Um, I, I've seen strange lights in the forest that I can't explain. Um, I've possibly saw a UFO in 2014. Um, I, I've heard screams and howls that would make the hair on your arm stand up. Um, I've heard the wood knocks. I've seen the footprints that are definitely footprints and they're not made by a bear or a boot or you know, a, a large animal. They're definitely human-like footprints that are much larger than a human's foot would be. So a lot of really cool experiences. Um, there's not really just one that I can name. So define Bigfoot, like, so I know the legend, like, of the Sasquatch, because I'm from the Pacific Northwest in Canada, um, British Columbia, and we have a huge Sasquatch mythos here, uh, Bigfoot mythos. So what is Bigfoot exactly? Well, that's a, that's a wonderful question, and at this point, I don't think we have a definitive answer as to what it is. Mm -hmm. Um that that really could be answered a variety of, of different ways depending on who is an, a, answering the question. In my opinion, I don't know what Bigfoot is. Um, I, I don't have enough definitive information to say it's a an upright walking hominid or uh, a missing link or an ancient race of people or an alien or uh, interdimensional traveler or, you know, a relic hominid. I, I just don't have enough information. I don't have enough, enough evidence in front of me to, to say what it is. Uh, there's a variety of mindsets. There's a variety of opinions and theories about what Bigfoot is, um, where it comes from, and where it goes. Uh, it depends on who you ask. As you know, the, the, the Chehalis tribe in British Columbia, they thought of Bigfoot as like the wild man of the woods. Yeah. Um, they, they, they feared it. I mean, yeah. I've read several cases where they've had encounters with this thing and they would literally make a, a tribute to the Bigfoot, whether it be smoking tobacco or leaving food out for it, kind of like a tribute to it so that it wouldn't attack and kill them. And I've read many accounts, especially from the 1930s, where um, the Shalish tribe would actually experience the Bigfoot and the encounters weren't positive. This thing would literally chase them back to their huts or their cabins, and and they would stay inside. They were so fearful of this creature. So um, there's there's so many different thoughts and theories about what it is, where it comes from, and and how it behaves. It's really hard to pinpoint a specific answer. Do you have a theory or a thought? Um, 
Actually, no, I, I don't. Not at this point. Um, I, when I first got involved in this and started researching it, I thought this was just a um, undiscovered species, an undiscovered primate mm -hmm. that was that crossed over from Russia across the uh, the land bridge that's no longer there into Alaska, and then migrated down into Canada, down into the United States, and, and that's what I thought it was was just an undiscovered primate, but. Mm -hmm. um, the more I've read about it, talking with other researchers, talking with eyewitnesses, I, I really don't know what this thing is. There's, there's just so much information, both conflicting and uh, agree agreeable information. Um, it's it's really hard to say what this thing is until we finally either have a body or we're able to come up with definitive proof. I don't think anybody's going to have an answer as to what Bigfoot is. So a lot of people are starting to lean more towards the alien slash interdimensional, um, or I, I shouldn't say they're not, they're leaning that way. I think, I think the field in general is just becoming more open-minded to that theory. Um, and I think a lot of it has to do with um, things that researchers or investigators have encountered um, while they're out searching for Bigfoot, um, like our good buddy Jay Bachochin. Um, and you had mentioned you saw lights in the forest. I wanted to ask, were your lights similar to the lights that Jay saw in the Kettle Moran? Um, pretty close, yeah. Um, the, I've seen lights on different occasions in different locations, which is, is fascinating to me because they've these lights have shown up in areas where there's been historical or current Bigfoot activity reported. Um, I know from my personal experience, at four or five of these locations that I've been to and seen the lights, there was either a sighting that took place just prior to us getting to that location or within a couple of weeks or months. Um, before we were at that location. So I don't know if there's any correlation between the two, but yeah, these lights are really strange. The lights that I've seen on the different occasions I've seen, like the first set of lights, I saw looked like somebody was walking through the forest carrying a lantern, and the lantern was swinging back and forth like if you were walking and swinging your right arm or left arm as you were walking. And that's what I thought it was until we approached the light put flashlights on where the light should be but there's nothing there when the flashlights hit that spot the light's gone you don't see anything and as soon as you back was away and turn the flashlight off or was it no it, 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 so it was it, it would not only was it swaying but it was actually moving across the landscape yeah. okay yeah yeah like like i said it looked like a person walking through the forest with the light swinging back and forth as it was moving through the trees that was just one occasion another occasion we saw uh, myself and another researcher were in southwestern Pennsylvania in Fayette County, and this was in 20, I want to say 2015 or 2016. Uh, we were in an area of known Bigfoot activity, and uh, very late at night, um, well, we, we got there earlier in the day. We had parked in a parking area, and we were planning on just hanging out right there at the trailhead and just watching the forest to see if anything happened, if we heard anything or yeah, anything came around. A family arrived. They went into the woods, they walked, hiked the trailhead in, and they took camping gear in. So we figured, oh, we're just going to stay here at the trailhead, let them go out in the woods. We'll stay back, and if something comes to visit them at their campsite, we can hear it, or we can observe what, you know, what may be observing them. And as the night progressed, uh, myself and the other researcher, we saw this light in the distance. And it looked like, the only way to really describe it, it looked like a campfire light. It was that orange, amber color. And it looked like it was flickering. But as time progressed, we began to see this light moving around. And I thought it was a trick of the eyes. I thought maybe it was just my imagination. But sure enough, this light was moving around the trees and along on, on the ground, almost like it was snaking in and out of the trees, weaving around trees. It would go up so high in the air and drop down and move around on, on the ground. It wasn't high at all. And both of us saw it. And the closer it got to us, um, I got freaked out. I was like, man, this is not normal. This is not something you normally see. And I just had this overwhelming feeling of, like, let's get the hell out of here because this shouldn't be happening. Almost like it was, it had bad intentions, whatever it was. And I talked to the other guy and uh, leaving, and we left and 
called it a night. And, and there's been other occasions. We had a sighting up in Fayette County back in 2016. It was uh, middle of May. Um, we received a report of two creatures that were sighted crossing a road in front of a vehicle. Uh, myself, Ricky Cherby, Sean and Tiffany Dennis, Dave Dragason, and his wife Cindy, we all went to the location where it happened, pulled off in this pull-off on the side of the road. About 11.30 at night, we're sitting there and hoping these creatures return. And that's when Tiffany mentioned she saw a white light in the forest not far behind us. And it was just floating through the trees like a, like a flashlight beam. And uh, we all started watching. And sure enough, we began to see it moving from tree to tree and zipping around real fast. Sometimes it would float very slowly and move around. And we just kind of watched it in amazement, like, what the heck is that? And then shortly after we were watching it, it, it disappeared and stopped. And then it appeared across the road all up on this ridge above us, and it was moving through the trees over there. It was very odd, but there, we could find no source of where it was coming from. You know, we saw nobody there were, at the pull-off where we were at. Nobody else was in the woods. Um, we have no explanation for where it came from. Well, yeah, and the movements you're describing don't sound like it, it could have been a human with a flashlight. No, because it was floating sometimes very slowly from tree to tree, and then other times it would zip real right. quick. And I thought, well, okay, it's May. Maybe it's a lightning bug or something. But this was about the size of a baseball. So it was much, much bigger than a lightning bug. Right. <laughs> it's one hell of a lightning bug. Yeah. But to be honest with you, I don't know if these lights are correlated somehow with Bigfoot. I don't know what... Uh, Jay and I have been out in the Kettle Moraine before as well, and the only thing we've ever experienced out there was hearing um, something walking through the, the woods, uh, possible eye shine, and smelling a really horrible sulfuric smell while we were out there, almost like a decaying animal. Yikes. Uh, and, and we never saw any lights, but Jay has seen the lights on many occasions. As a matter of fact, I just talked to him this uh, last night, and he was telling me he had seen lights when he was out doing a, a drive around the Kettle Moraine area. He was out by himself driving his car, and he would just seen some weird lights out there just this past weekend so yeah the lights are intriguing uh, it's but it, it just it's, it's becoming a pattern so you know it, it makes you wonder like what what is the light what does it have to do with the bigfoot i mean they it it, it appears that they're um showing up at the same time right or, or shortly behind each other so yeah um ron moorhead um a friend of mine he put up the, the uh, Sierra Sounds CDs from 1973 and 74 up in the Sierra Mountains of Northern California. He um, spent some time at this very remote uh, camp. It was a hunting camp that he and others had uh, put together. And, and during that time period of 73, 74, he uh, recorded these really intriguing sounds that uh, I don't know what the heck they are, to be honest with you. But he just came forward recently to... Um, release information that I was unaware of that during that time period in 73, 74, and even after that, when he had returned to the camp many, many years later, he had, he and his daughter and other campers had seen strange lights moving around the campsite. And he, he was almost certain there had been Bigfoot there during the 73, 74 encounters that he recorded. But here, years afterwards, he'd gone back and uh, now he's seeing these strange lights up there in that, that area. And many other researchers are reporting them as well. It, it's, it's a weird phenomenon that's just becoming more um, shared by researchers who are ex experiencing it. So what is the correlation, do you think, between the lights? Because Marie had a theory the other, when we were talking about this before. Do you remember, Marie, when we were talking about this? I can't remember, even remember why. Um. When you suggest, because my biggest thing is like, if they haven't found Bigfoot, like, where does he go? How does he hide from all these people with all this technical equipment, high, high, like, technical equipment? H how would he hide? Where, where left is there to hide? Well, that's the thing. No, but no one really knows. And, and I've come to the conclusion about one thing for sure, certain about Bigfoot. Either it's a real animal that we know nothing about, and we're just starting to touch the tip of the iceberg when it comes to this phenomenon and starting to, to maybe see things unfold in front of us or it's the greatest hoax of modern age um, it, it's something that's gone on for hundreds of years the footprints are all fabricated the settings are all made up and, and misidentifications and illusions the uh, personal experiences that uh, government officials law enforcement um, 
credible eyewitnesses, men, women, and children. There's no demographic. There's no race. There's no age um, pattern that we can see as far as people seeing this. It, it, it happens to just random people out in the forest or in the right place at the right time who are seeing things. So it's either the greatest hoax of all time that's going on and it continues to go on and no one's been ever able to ever stop it from continuing or it's a living thing that we have not fully understood yet and we're probably not going to be able to understand it in my lifetime. No, no, don't, don't, don't say that. Don't, don't be so quick to, I mean, we, we, you never know. Well, the reason I say that is because um, there are researchers who have literally given up their entire lives for the dedication to studying this phenomenon. They've been funded financially by millionaires or private industry. Um, one, one name comes to, to mind, Peter Byrne. Um, he, he started this phenomenon researching it back in the 1950s, and he was funded by several millionaires, um, several private companies donated money to him. He was a wildlife tracker and an, uh, a hunter. And I mean, this guy's been all over the world. He's your modern day, modern day Indiana Jones. And um, he's in his late 80s now, I believe, mid, mid to late 80s. And the mystery's still not solved, and it probably won't be in his lifetime. And you know, I, I understand we're moving forward with technology, with advancements. Um, we're still no closer to solving the mystery. So I, I'm, I'm content at this point to say that it probably won't be solved in my lifetime. I'm okay with that. But hopefully one day we'll have enough information to either prove that it's a living, breathing animal that just was never un, 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 undiscovered or was never... Uh, categor uh, categorized or cataloged, it was never proven to be real, um, that is now proven to be real, or it's some kind of alien or interdimensional being. Hopefully sometime in the future they'll be able to figure out what it is one way or the other and put, a, put it to bed. And that's what uh, Marie came up with that theory or told me about that theory. And it made perfect sense to me. And I know this is going to probably sound crazy, like, oh, perfect sense, interdimensional being. But I mean, there's... the Space dimensions is so vast, it's so wide, we can't possibly think that we're the only creatures in it. And that, for me, made a lot of sense. And, yeah, maybe I am crazy, I don't know. But I'm, I'm really into, like, the lake monsters myself. Um, I actually went to Scotland and went to Loch Ness, too. So, you know. In search of. In search of. And... I think with lake monsters, it's a bit different because lakes can have all these underwater caverns that you can't find. And so it's easier to say, oh, yeah, you know, they can hide in there. Right. Um, whereas the terrestrial beings, you know, it's a bit tougher. But Marie, when you said that, that interdimensional, you know, just pop in and out. That made a lot of sense to me. I mean, it, for me, it's it's one of the, it's one of the only logical conclusions if the creature actually ex exists. I, to me, it's I've, I've boiled it down to three options, uh, and it's like Eric said: either it's a, a, a an actual animal that no one's caught. You know, we've got these blurry photos in the the Patterson Gimlin film. Um, which is always being questioned, right? Um, but no, we had no living creature or no carcass. Uh, so, but but it's either one. It's, it's either that, and and they maybe um, when they die, they bury them their brethren. So that's why we don't find them. I mean, who knows? Who who knows why we don't have a, a carcass? Um, or maybe they just die and are get, get ate up by the woodland creatures. And, but you, would th but there would still be bones. It's, yeah, you'd find bones. So it's either a physical creature, like a real animal that just is very, very, very rare and very, very, very intelligent, or it's interdimensional and it's going in between dimensions. And then third, it is coming down up and off of an alien. Off, uh, off of an alien. It's coming off of an alien. It's coming <laughs> off of a spaceship. It's coming from another planet. Yes. 
And it's like getting beamed up or, you know, how are they beam themselves? I mean, I don't think they land the craft, right? Like they beam the little guy. Well, he's not a little guy. They beam the big guy down and then he just crashes through the woods for a little while and then they beam him back up. Well, if they've managed to be able to build a spaceship that can come from their planet to here, they probably have all kinds of ways that we don't know about to beam up and beam down or apparate up or apparate down or who knows, right? Once you open that other worldly door, you know what I mean? It's yeah, yeah. No, no use even trying to figure that out. Maybe they are the light. Maybe they come down as the light and then appear in a material form that they take so they can breathe the oxygen, walk on the land. Who knows? Or gather something that, who knows? Yeah, that's, that's, that, I mean, that's why people yeah. like Eric do, you know, commit 40 years of their life to get this answer, right? But Eric, I mean, so when you're out on investigations, you are seeing things that you can't explain. Yeah, I am, but I like I said at the beginning of the interview, I can't say definitively that they're made by Bigfoot or caused by Bigfoot because I've, I've never seen a Bigfoot creature. Um, so I, I don't know what's causing the phenomenon. The only thing I can say for certain is that the phenomenon is real. And what I mean by that is there's something that's something or someone that's leaving footprints that are discovered in remote forests and, and remote areas all around the globe. Uh, as you mentioned, it's a multicultural mm. uh, phenomenon going on that's, that's happening in, in countless continents and different places all around the world. Um, the people are seeing something, and not all of them can be misidentifications. I mean, I'm sure that there are those that are misidentifications or hallucinations or figments of the imagination, but I'm not sure. I, I can't honestly say that they all are. No. Uh, all it takes is one person to be telling the truth when they had an experience or had a sighting and to, to oh. prove the phenomenon's real. So that, that's all it really takes. And out of the thousands and thousands of eyewitnesses that have, who've come forward over the years and shared their experiences, I really think there is something to the phenomenon. I, like I said earlier though, I don't think I'm gonna be able to solve it in my lifetime or at least to get a definitive idea of what it is. Um, it's, a, it's a rabbit hole, it really is. Once you start down the rabbit hole, and you think you're coming close to finding what this may be, all of a sudden you, you hit that curve or that turn and you're off in another direction, which takes you into a completely different possibility of what this thing might be. And it it's changed and it's evolved so much since I first started studying about it back in the early 1980s. Did you have anything else you wanted to ask him about the Loch Ness Monster? Well, I mean, I could ask you about it all day. Do you believe in the um, aquatic uh, cryptids? Uh, I think there's something in the lakes people are seeing and experiencing. Um, I don't know if it truly is a lake monster or maybe perhaps uh, a giant fish or an eel or a snake or something that they're seeing and misidentifying. Um, like, like, much like Bigfoot, there's not enough hard proof to say these things are real. Um, Loch Ness, for example, they just completed a, uh, a very extensive test of the DNA yeah. they pulled from the water. Yeah. And the only determination they were able to come away with is um, it's full of common wildlife and eels. And perhaps what people are seeing is a giant eel that comes up to the surface and swims along the surface of the water, therefore giving off the illusion of humps and then going back down under the water to disappear. Uh, at this point, I don't know if, if lake monsters truly do exist or not. It's a fascinating subject, and uh, I know a lot of credible people are, have been looking into the subject for quite some time. But until we are able to actually pull a live or dead specimen out of Loch Ness or any of the lakes around the, the country or around the, the world, for that matter, it's just another strange phenomenon that continues to baffle us. But strange phenomenon make life delicious. I mean, I remember when I first heard about Loch Ness, I was five years old, and my dad built me one out of snow. And he said that's and he named her Nessie and I was like, well, what is that? And he told me the story and then like you, Eric, just well, not as serious as you uh, by any stretch of the imagination. But it, it developed a lifelong obsession for me until I finally did go to Scotland and, and go to Loch Ness. And I actually brought some water back with me. I have some water and some rocks from Loch Ness. 
That's cool. Yeah, it's really cool. So I, I kept it as a, I made my friend drink a bottle of tequila so I could bring the water back. <laughs> it was real hard to, to talk her into doing that too. Right? She's a good friend. She's a good friend. She did that for me. And uh, yeah, and and so it just captures the imagination and it gives you something more to your life. So, Spe pardon, go ahead. I was going to say, speaking of imagination, um, I'm just on the edge of my seat here, dying to get to this <laughs> part of the the talk. Um, so, Eric, I watched the final. Um, uh, season of uh, Mountain Monsters. <laughs> I was wondering if you were going to bring that up. <laughs> <laughs> and I, um, so I, I had it in my DVR for quite a while because um, I think I, I, it was only like four or five episodes long. It was super short, right? Actually, there were ten episodes. Um, some of them they ran together as like two parters. So it, it was it was an interesting season, but. In my opinion, it was a little disappointing the way they left off at the end of the episode. Major cliffhanger. I don't want to spoil it for anybody, but they left off long before they, we found out who Spearfinger is. And it almost seemed as if they weren't done investigating the other cryptids they were told to investigate. And uh, at this point, because of the COVID, um, they were not able to continue filming. Hopefully, they'll be able to start filming again once this whole COVID thing blows over. But, yeah, they, they kind of left us in a lurch as to what what happens next and and actually i as you know i'm friends with huckleberry and mm -hmm. buck the whole crew and mm -hmm. once it was over I, I reached out to those guys and i said you know congratulations on another successful season and the fans are going to love it but this last episode was that truly the season finale or the season cliffhanger and buck wrote me back and said yep that's the, the last episode for the season and it was disappointing because i was like man okay well where do we go from here we what happens have, next yeah so, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um. Oh God, boy, did it get crazy too? It got, it got, it, it got crazy. Yeah, it it, it went off the rails. I mean, the yeah. hooded dudes and the it just was. It just got weird, real yeah. fast. Um, and I mean, it was it was. It was still very intriguing. I was very much into it. Like I, I wanted to, you know, that that's, I, I, I want to know if there's going to be, you know, another season, right? Like they, they left it on such a, a cliffhanger. Oh man! It and Je oh, the stuff that Jeff <laughs> went through. Yeah. I mean, well, okay, and, I went through. And yeah. Barry, I, yeah. I was like, wait a second, and Buck. But I mean, all of them. They all. It just was. It's so. It was so crazy. And I don't want. And, and I. I. I know. I'm just using the same. I sound like um, our commander and chief using the same descriptive over and over. <laughs> 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 but I don't want to spoil it for anybody. So I'm just. You know. It was. It was very. It was very intriguing. And I do hope that that uh, they at least get one more season to kind of tie things up. Um, a little bit for us. Well, the last I had heard from Huckleberry about the next season is they got they got picked up again for another season, so they're definitely going to film. It's just a matter of when they're going to film for the season because of this COVID virus that's going on. Um, they they were supposed to film this spring, but that got put on hold. So who knows when they're going to actually be able to to get back out in the woods and film a season? Was it seven now? I think or eight or I lost track, but. Um, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see what happens when they f start filming. And, and the f sad fact that uh, Trapper passed away this past uh, yeah. winter, and you know they're they're without their team leader now. So it's going to be interesting to see who steps up as the new leader and what's going to happen with the guys. Um, I, I had the chance to to hang out with the, the guys back in November. Um, they they came to my hometown for an event, and we got to hang out and talk and everything like that. And and we actually talked a little bit about Trapper, how he was doing, and he was he was still um, of ill health, but he was starting to improve and actually get back out into the public eye a little bit, and, and you know getting around, still doing Trapper things. And then all of a sudden, this hit us out of the blue, where he passed away. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, uh, the, the Ames team won't be the same without him. But uh, hopefully, the new season that comes out, if it comes out will be uh, just as intriguing and just as good as the last ones were. Yeah, man. I, talk about ra a rabbit hole, right? Yeah, it, it's... I think crazy's a nice way of putting this past <laughs> season. Uh, 
I, I watched it with uh, my wife. Actually, I got her hooked on it, and she's watching it now too. And and we watched it every week. And by the when the episode was over, I was just like, okay, that's yeah, that's just that's just wow, that's too much. Yeah. And then you watch, and then you watch the next one, and, and you, you're like, oh, I guess they can take it a little bit further. <laughs> and they did each and week. Yeah. <laughs> Each week was something different, something new, and uh, a twist. Now, people may not know this or not, but the, the, the creature Spearfinger does actually exist in Cherokee legend. And, and Spearfinger is thought to be a shapeshifter or uh, a skinwalker, if you will. Maybe even a Bigfoot type of creature that is able to morph into yeah. other creatures. It does exist in their legends and lore and their, their tribal tales. So that skin, that uh, spear finger thing that they talk about is something that was actually um, talked about and brought up by the Cherokee Nation. So I, I found that interesting that they incorporated into the, you know this season. What do you know about spear finger? The actual the 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 real. Um... I well, let me rephrase what I, I was gonna say. <laughs> what's the um? What's the history? Like, what's the history of Spearfinger? I, honestly, I don't know much about it. I haven't done a lot of research on Spearfinger. Um, I didn't honestly think it existed until just recently, when I was I heard on uh, one of the documentaries I was watching, uh, um, a Cherokee tribal historian was talking about Spearfinger that it was a a skinwalker or. Uh, some of the tribe may have misinterpreted or interpreted it as a Bigfoot-like creature that has the ability to, to morph and change into other animals like owls or coyotes or wolves, that sort of thing. And that's really all I was able to gather from what Spearfinger may be. But there is a, a history in the Cherokees, uh, you know, tribal tales, if you will. And unfortunately, I probably have to look more into it to see exactly what it is and where it comes from and how it developed. But I do know that it is part of their their history. It's the Cherokee uh, legend from the eastern side of Tennessee, and they called her. Uh, now forgive me, everybody, if I'm mispronouncing this. Uglunta, and it means one with pointed spear. Huh. Well, so it's, uh, it's, her mouth is stained with blood from the livers she ate, and she often clutched her right hand tightly because her hidden heart and only weak spot was in her right palm. And the and and uh, the native Canadians as well have a legend very similar to this called the Junaqua. So they have strong, scary women seem to be an underlying theme here. Well, the like yeah. it, I like it. Uh, um, it's interesting <laughs> to me, Eric, that um, you mentioned Skinwalker because yeah. with Skinwalkers, um, are known to be able to morph, right, and and change into different shapes, different animals, potentially even uh, take on a human shape, which may have something to to do with what they were dealing with in the woods yes the skinwalker lore um again relates back to the native american tribes and there's different takes and different versions of what a skinwalker is essentially skinwalkers were dark medicine men medicine women shamans of the group that committed heinous acts of killing another human being and then they performed dark magic and were able to take the shape of coyotes and owls and wolves, mainly canids, but they, they were said to be humans that became possessed or became evil and they were able to, to morph or shapeshift into animals. And they would specifically haunt certain locations. And I know some of the tribes from reading about and studying about, it, it's very um, taboo or are not, they're not permitted to speak about the, the skinwalker because they're afraid that if they do, the skinwalker will come after them and chase them and try to hunt them down and kill them. So they, they prefer not to talk about it. And I know the Navajo tribe in like Arizona, New Mexico, uh, they, they're really, really afraid of this, the skinwalker because once it comes around, it can cause a lot of bad juju, mojo, whatever you want to call it. It can make people's lives miserable and even cause people to die. 
That's, you know, the First Nations have some fantastic legends. Like, it kind of reminds me of the Wendigo. Mm -hmm. Which is, was a human that was a cannibal? Same kind of thing? Yeah, the, the Wendigo was a, a human that was possessed by the spirit of the Wendigo. He, in turn, he or she, in turn, becomes evil. And to fully become the Wendigo, they must kill one of their loved ones and then eat the remains of the loved one. Then that, that gives them the ultimate power to become the Wendigo. And then they stalk you know, the others trying to kill them and, and make their lives miserable as well. There, there's different variations on the Wendigo as well, and it's it's a pretty terrifying creature. It's pretty terrifying, all right. Was the Wendigo one of the creatures in in the in the mountain monsters? One of the ones in the book? Was mm, it? No. It wasn't. No, not, okay. No, not, not the Wendigo. No. I was like, wow. <laughs> if, if I was, I I was kind of tripping on that. So I appreciate the clarification. I think they did one on um. The Wolfman, didn't they? Werewolf? They've done a couple on yeah. Dogman and, and Dog Canid, upright walking Canids, and, and like werewolf type of creatures. Not necessarily a werewolf per se, but Dogman like creatures. They've done a couple episodes on those in the past. That was the Devil Dog, wasn't it? The Devil Dog one? Actually, the Devil Dogs were creatures that were much larger than. Hell, right? Yeah, the, larger the than a wolf. And these things were very aggressive, killing farm animals and, and terrorizing people. And yeah, they were much larger than your typical coyote or wolf. Very large. And they were said, some thought, some people think that they actually are servants or pets, if you will, of Bigfoot. And they follow them around and do their bidding. But that's another whole topic off there. Yeah, I was going to say, because then that would mean that Bigfoot was mean. Well. He was nice. <laughs> it I depends just on who you said. ask. I always, I always just assumed. Maybe Harry and the Hendersons led me to believe it. I don't know. Yeah, that was a Hollywood Bigfoot. <laughs> That's a Hollywood Bigfoot. But we have, like, here in the Kokanee, we have actually, like, a whole beer brand up here called Kokanee that's um, based on Bigfoot. And they have the Bigfoot uh, in all the commercials, and mm -hmm. the Kokanee comes and I've, takes the Kokanee. I have a six-pack of Kokanee beer on my shelf. Do you really? Yeah. Oh, that's hilarious. So you've been to uh, British Columbia. I, I've been to wa Northern Washington State back in 2010. Okay. I was in Seattle, actually, Marie, back in 2010 before I knew you. Yeah, I know. I, 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 I checked that date in my head real quick. I was like, what? <laughs> 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 yeah, it was before we, we had met. But yeah, too bad because we would have had a good time. We could have had some kokanies. Yeah. It's not a great beer. That's why you still have it. Yeah, I, I never opened it. It's more of a collector's item than anything, and I certainly wouldn't open and drink it now. Oh, no, um, no, no. <laughs> I tried to have a kokanee beer while I was up there, and it, it was just, uh, it was, I did not like it. It's awful. Canadian, well, I still think Canadian beer is better than American beer. Sorry. Um, yeah, ooh, fighting words, fighting words. Um, but kokanee is not. Sorry for anybody who likes kokanee. That's listening to this. We all have a right to our opinions and, and yeah. preferences. It's not a great beer. I like Neither Mexican beer. Pardon? Oh, yeah. Like, Corona, right? Yeah, I like Mexican beer. So. I like Mexican beer. I like Stella Artois. It's really good, That's too. My, wait, that is my favorite. Is that the Stella? I I'll have to remember that. I have to remember that when I come see you. Um, but we have, I like Honey, Sleeman's Honey Ale is my favorite beer right now if we're talking about beer yeah, since we're talking beer what's your favorite beer eric um corona god damn it <laughs> god he damn just it. said that for real are you are you yeah. are you cracking jokes it's no I, that's my favorite beer is corona oh okay okay it's beer it's have you beer. tried their seltzer no not yet i almost grabbed it the other night and i was like eh. I, I don't i typically don't like seltzer even a non-alcoholic seltzer so i was like that's why i didn't but I almost uh, did. I thought about it. I was like, I, can't, I mean, you know, I'll catch a buzz. So, mm -hmm. you know, even if it does taste gross, I'd still catch a buzz. But yeah, I, I just drink Corona. Have you, um, now that you're home and working from home, and I think you, you were, were on standby for a minute, right? Where you weren't having to work from home? Uh, no, actually, I've been working from home since March. Since oh, wow. the beginning. Yeah. Ah, 
Have you um, had the luxury to watch any new-ish scary movies? Um, no, not really. Uh, I, I, I tried to check out a couple new ones, um, and I, I, I couldn't tell you the name of what they were. <laughs> the only one I remember seeing was um, a movie, I think it was called Haunt. Oh, was, I think uh, I've seen that one. Yeah, it was a makeshift haunted house um, that these kids, the teenage kids, want to go check out, and then they end up all getting. Yes, I saw yeah. that. Yeah, I actually thought that was pretty good. And was I'll it? I have to watch it. Well, yeah, because it had like an it had like an M Night Shyamalan ending, right? If it's the one I'm thinking of, right, Eric? Yeah, yeah. it's 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 bizarre. It really is. It was well done. Yeah, it, it was it was not a bad movie as far as production and you know. Different ideas, new ideas, but overall, to me, it was just like, eh, this is weird. I mean, it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't like, it certainly wasn't scary. Like, yeah, it, it no, didn't, I, wasn't. I, I don't think at any given point I was, like, scared. Um, but, I, but it was a good, it's a good, it's, it's worth a watch. Like I always say, it's worth a watch. Everything is always worth a watch. Um, I recently came across a movie uh, I don't know if you've heard about this, Eric. It's called Antrim, the no, deadliest movie ever made. No, I haven't heard of it. Oh my gosh! Um, don't so watch it. Don't watch <laughs> it. I tried to watch it and I got so scared I had to turn it off because it's just freaky. It's like unsettling scary. It's not fun scary. Well, you could say that. I mean, you could say that about the last house on the left too. You right? Yeah. Well, yeah, but I mean, even that's like, you kind of know what's going to happen, right? Well, like, both... Conjuring was fun scary. The Exorcist is fun scary. This was... Oh, I don't think The Exorcist is fun scary. It's fun scary compared to that movie, and for me to say that, because that's the movie that scares me the most, that Antrim just freaked me out. Well, so the premise, so the idea, the... Uh, in a nutshell, Eric... It, the, if you watch, it's footage, it's a movie, a movie that was made in 1972. It was made for a film festival. They um, entered it into 10 festivals and it was rejected. Finally, it was ex accepted in the 11th one um, that they submitted it to. Um, they played the movie and the theater caught on fire and burnt. And I think there was a few deaths. I want to say six. Um but the, the, the perplexing part to them was most fires in a movie theater occur in the projection room um, because, the, you know, the film gets hot and catches on fire, right? But this fire it, it originated in the actual theater, um, like in the seats. And they don't know, you know, if maybe someone intentionally did it. They, they, it was unsolved, like, fire. They don't know if it was arson or what it was, but it, it definitely wasn't the typical fire. Um, then, uh, some small theater decided they were going to show it and they played it and that movie theater caught on fire. So they put the reel on the shelf and said, we're, this film is cursed and we're never going to show it again ever, ever. And it got buried away for 20 years. And now this guy comes across it and he, you know, finds the, the, the backstory that I just gave of any, he, so he's like, okay. Here, I have found the movie. I'm going to present it to you with this disclaimer that you're probably going to get cursed if you watch it, and you could even potentially die. And then you watch the movie. Um, now, that's where Kari turned it off. <laughs> yeah, because I don't want to get cursed. <clears throat> even more so than I already am. Well, Eric and I, we're already cursed. <laughs> Think so? Eric, are you cursed? Um... <laughs> Yeah, no comment. See? No comment. So I, I, I watched it, and um, I noticed that there was obvious subliminal things going on in the background. And we um, very painstakingly went frame by, you know, frame by frame to catch the subliminal messages, um, which were in Latin, I believe. I had to translate most of them. Um, others were symbols. A lot of pentacles, pentagrams, uh, baphomet. Um, the movie gets really dark pretty fast. I mean, well, about halfway, in, the actual movie movie, right? Like, that was filmed in 1972. Um, and it, 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 
I watched it. I watched it all the way to the what end. Happens? What happens? Um, well, I don't want to spoil it for anybody. Well, um, but I will say that when you think it's the end of the movie, it's not really the end of the movie. You got to keep watching because um, there's a little bit more that happens before it actually ends. Um, and then, uh, yeah. I just, I, I just want, I just wondered if you had heard about it, Eric, or, or had seen it, because, um, you know, we suffered the BTE curse, and now I've gone and uh, cursed myself by watching Antrim. Good job. She just like lives on the edge. She does. I prefer. She's a rebel. Beyond the edge. <laughs> I prefer not to live in. The, I like to. I no. I didn't like that movie at all. For I like the the stuff in the beginning part when they're talking about it. It's it's a great build up. I I don't know what it is about that. Yeah, it's enough to get you to not watch it. Right, it was a great build up, but I'm a big baby, as you know. Um, and then when the actual movie came on, it was just there's just something about that old grainy foreign horror films that just I don't know. I like to be pretend scared. If that makes any sense. I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't think it does. Eric, have you seen the movie Terrifier? No. Like I said, I, I really haven't seen many of the new horror films that have been out in the last couple of years. Um, I, I've seen the Halloween remake. I've seen um, Three from Hell. Oh, um, that was terrible. That was such I, a I, yeah. I that one. I, was it terrible? Yeah, it was horrible. Um, I saw 31 that Rob Which, Zombie did. That's another crap. Didn't yeah. care for 31. And, yeah. and I saw this movie called Haunt, and that's, that's really it. Um, I'm a fan of the old school horror movies um, from the 80s and 90s. I'm not a big fan of the stuff that's out today. It's just, I don't know. Maybe I got desensitized from it and just died. It decided to stop watching it. Terrifier. Um, now, that that was one I would say is a pretend scare. Um but that movie fucking scared me. Like, when I'm home alone at night, I'm scared that motherfucker is going to be in my backyard. Is that the clown guy? Yeah, the black and white clown guy. Why is it so scary? I, I think his name is Archie. He, you gotta watch it. You just gotta watch it. I'm scared of the little girl from The Exorcist all the time. And I have the mask so they can dress up like her on Halloween. But for the rest of the year, I have to keep the mask in a bin in the basement far away from me. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> My car is named Reagan. See, I, and I, I have a why. little... <laughs> I don't know why you... Why do you tempt that kind of thing? Like, that to me is... Demonic Possession, for me, is... It's the a movie! Ultimate. I know, but it's... There's something about it that's just so frightening. I don't know whether it's because I saw it when I was, like, 10. Um, whether the sound... Because the sound and the... Nothing has scared me like that since. And I don't think anything ever will. And maybe it's because I was young when I saw it. I don't know. But it's just a combination of the sound and the visual effects and the story and the fact that it was based on a true story. The Roland Doe kid. Um, I think they actually found out his real name. And the priest and the that to me is... I mean, the, hence why I started even listening to your show, right? Because you had something like that. I can't remember who you interviewed. But, I mean, we do a lot of that kind of stuff and that's kind of our pursuit eric so i kind of you know like you with the with the cryptids marie and i are always pursuing the myth of of malevolent hauntings and demonic activity and i think that's why it scared me so badly because i believe in it yeah i mean i well we, we both said you know i was well we were both supposed to be guinea pigs but I'm the guinea pig to see if it's actually true. Um, and the way that this interview's gone, I can tell you that it is. <laughs> that was curse? a joke. That was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> the curse. But let's get back to cryptids really quick. I have one last uh, cryptid question for Cryptosabi. And that is, um, have there been any Mothman sightings associated with the COVID disaster? Um, nothing that I've heard of. Um, I, I know there have been some recent things that have been seen and reported in the Illinois area, especially Chicago, but I haven't heard from Lon if there's been any recent sightings 
or people have encountered anything from the Mothman. Um, as far as I know, he's been pretty quiet for a while. So, yeah, I, I haven't heard anything in relation to the COVID. I, well, I would suspect that maybe um, in maybe in China, you know, in Wuhan, you know, a month or so before it became an uh, an issue there, because that's right where it started. Um, I'm, maybe there was some sort of sighting. I, I just, you know, he's supposed to be the the harbinger of of doom, right? So I yeah. just was thinking someone maybe somewhere saw something before this kicked off. Yeah, I think maybe instead of the, the person eating the bat and getting sick, they actually ate the Mothman and got sick. <laughs> so, oh, so man. Possibly what happened. Yeah. A little Mothman. And now, he, now he's in quarantine, so that's why we're not seeing him. But Damn even it. if people do see something like that, it's like, do you report it? Because most people will see something like that and think, no, that, that's, I didn't see that. The Mothman? Um, it's hard to say whether people will report it or not because in 66 and 67 in Point Pleasant, West Virginia, where it was originally experienced and sighted, there were over 100 people that came forward to share their experiences and their sightings. In the Chicago area, there's been dozens upon dozens of reports of people coming forward and by very credible people, uh, police officers, um, very experienced, um, very reputable professionals in the field have come forward and reported it. So, yeah, I, I don't see... I think maybe... Perhaps back in the day, it would be a little less um, wise for your career, for your reputation to come forward and report something like that. But now it's so commonly accepted by the mainstream media and the general public that it's almost cool to, to have a sighting and come forward to report it. Yeah. And do you have a theory? Do you have a theory of what Mothman is? Is it like a snoop supernatural creature or? Much like Bigfoot, it's hard to put a, a real determination or um, a definitive conclusion of what it is. I mean, there's so many different theories about what Mothman is, whether it's a flying humanoid, an alien, um, visitor from an interdimensional world, um, a giant... Angel? I've heard Angel of Death, the Harbinger of Doom. Um, I've heard um, a mutated um, giant heron, blue, uh, blue heron, or crane... Um, oh so right! Things because he was often cited at the um, the TNT. Uh, yeah, the wildlife. Center. Yeah, right. Yeah, and where they stored all the ammo, and they thought that maybe there had been a they'd buried chemicals or something, and then a blue heron got into it, and it was it you know was like teenage mutant ninja heron. <laughs> yeah. They actually have found several ponds, drainage ponds, where they've leaked chemicals into those ponds. And there's there's actually toxic waste in some of those, at, at that uh, wildlife reserve, there's toxic waste in some of those ponds. So that's why they, they honestly thought there was mutated birds, that that's where the Mothman came from. Well, and scientifically, I mean, that is a, an, op an option. Well, uh, according to to the eyewitness descriptions, this thing stood about six foot tall. It looked like a giant hominid or human with arms and legs, but had these giant bat-like wings on the back of it. And uh, that's what they were seeing. Other people claimed it was a giant bird with a huge wingspan. So I don't know if it was necessarily a, a mutated bird, but I don't, I don't see a mutated bird turning into a, a humanoid looking thing. Yeah, and like, where, why is it popping up all the time before some great disaster happens? Well, it's not all the time. It, no. It Personally, I think that's just coincidence. Oh. Um, I, I don't think that actually the the Mothman being in Point Pleasant during the the when oh, the right bridge before fell. Before the bridge, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't think that had, he or whatever it was had anything to do with the bridge falling. I think it was faulty maintenance on the bridge, and it, they, they determined it was an eye link that actually broke. It snapped that caused the bridge to fall. So I don't think the Mothman really had anything to do with that. But other people theorize different. There's a lot of well, different there was opinions. A there was a lot of weird, weird stuff going on, though, when the Mothman sightings were going on. Mm -hmm. um, John uh, Keel and the in Indrid Cole business. Well, the Indrid Cole had really nothing to do with Mothman at all. 
surprisingly. That happened in Parkersburg, West Virginia, which is um, far away from Point Pleasant. And I only have to do with into Mary Parker's office. No, he didn't. Um, that and Mary, um, she actually. Oh, she dealt with the men in black. Yes, she dealt with a possible man in black. Um, Andrew Cold actually. Um, I can't remember his last name. I want to say Derenberger um, yes, was his yeah, name. Yes, yeah. And um, he had experiences where he was driving down 77 towards uh, Parkersburg and a supposed UFO landed in front of his vehicle and this alien got out, walked back to his car and communicated with him, uh, told him who he was, said he was in- injured cold and, and he would see him again and, and supposedly over the Woody Derenberger's um, life, he had multiple encounters with Indrid Cold, and his family even had encounters with Indrid Cold as well. But that had nothing to do with Mothman. But didn't Woody live in Point Pleasant during the Mothman? No. He didn't? No. Nope. He didn't live anywhere near Point Pleasant. Well, um, it was just associated. Yeah. It was associated with it because it happened at the same time that the Mothman phenomenon was going on. And you are right about one thing. During that whole 66, 67, oh, no. There was a huge flap of UFO sightings that took place in Point Pleasant that was going on. And paranormal uh, phenomena, a lot of poltergeist activity where electronics were getting weird noises and static and feedback. And TVs were shutting on and off. And then the men in black came into town. And Mary Heyer was actually the reporter. That's her name, yes. Who had the encounter with uh, this little version of a man in black who came into her office and with and stole one of, yeah, and stole one of his one of her pens before he snickered and ran out of the office. So, yeah, it was weird weird experiences, but it was a lot more than just the Mothman going on in Point Pleasant. There was a, a it was basically a, like John Keel called it a, a a window window area with a variety of different paranormal phenomenon going on. I was gonna say a, a, a shit storm of paranormal activity going on. Yeah. Right. Yeah, Maybe like some kind of portal opened up and just a whole bunch of stuff came through. Nobody Some, knows. Something. Nobody knows. Yeah. It was definitely strange. Do you have so, any um, appearances or, or projects that you want to promote? Well, um, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, you do the big Bigfoot camping trip every year, don't you? Like the researcher's camping trip? Um. Uh, the... No. no. <laughs> but you used to. <laughs> you um, used to? The P- I the used big... to. Yeah. I used to. I we we did three of the Pennsylvania Bigfoot camping adventures. Um, one in 2016, one in 2017, mm-hmm. and one in 2019. And our plan originally was to do one in 2021, but um, we took a unfortunately we took a bath financially on the 2019 event, and oh my. my health is not getting any better. So. I decided to show that project for now, and it's not like BT Radio. It's not dead and buried. It's there's a possibility it'll come back again one day. Just you know, on a things, hiatus, right? Yeah, it's on a hiatus, so that that's put on the shelf for the time being, temporarily. And like BT Radio, that's on the shelf temporarily until I can get my health back to start doing the show again. But um, I, I had scheduled about 15 events this year uh, i was scheduled to speak at starting in march all the way through august um we're, we're talking Mu- mufon symposiums phenomenology um a variety of different paranormal conferences bigfoot events and they were all canceled because of the covid virus so i, I have like two or three coming up in the fall i would have to check my schedule and see what they are i know one of them is definitely weird uh, i think it's called weird and wild con or Wild and Weird Con of West Virginia that's coming up in November, and a, a handful of other things that are coming up. But that, that's about it. I'm um, working on my project right now, archiving um, articles, newspaper articles from the 1800s to present day um, on a variety of phenomenon, whether it be cryptid related, Bigfoot related, UFOs, uh, hauntings, and, and just strange phenomenon here in Pennsylvania. And uh, I'm going decade, decade by decade and uh, collecting newspaper reports, reports, scanning them, um, and uploading them to my computer so that I can eventually get them online for everybody to enjoy and read. And uh, that's something I've been working on now since you know we're kind of stuck in the house, not really able to go anywhere. But that, that's really about it. Well, I'm looking forward to being able to get into those archives. Yeah, that's going to be quite the database. 
Yeah, the, it, it's really surprising. Um, I'm, I'm looking at two of the binders now. I actually had to buy two of the, the heavy duty giant, I think four inch, the four inch rings yeah. and the binders. Um, the first one is filled from 1970 to 1975, and the second one's filled from 75 to 79. Wow, uh, about, that many. There's probably about five to five to six hundred articles in just one binder. So those that decade of the 70s, there's probably close to 11, 1100, 1200 articles in there. That's amazing. That's I a lot. That's a lot of work too, man. Good for you. It gives me something to do, and uh, it's a lot of has a lot of educational value to it because yeah. these articles and and what I try to do is narrow my search down to just. New, Pennsylvania newspapers and the, the stories and articles they released and I was hoping to find mainly stuff on just Pennsylvania but it's a it's a Pandora's box on everything because they, they don't just talk about phenomenon here in PA they talk about phenomenon that was occurring all over the globe so I've got articles on Nessie and lake monsters UFO sightings different cryptids um, just a, a wild variety of, of different phenomenon that was published in multiple Pennsylvania newspapers during those those decades Kari do you have any last questions for Eric I have about a thousand questions for Eric but I'm sure he doesn't have enough time to answer them all so I think <laughs> I will pick one Eric if they ever did find Sasquatch what would you want to happen Name your, your, I mean, because I know you've thought about it a thousand times. What would you do? What would you do if you did see him? Uh, if I actually saw him, I'd probably tell my close friends, and that would be about it. Um, I, I think I'd relish the, the sighting that I had, and it would be closure for me as far as the past 40 years of my life, knowing that it wasn't a waste of time and a waste of effort and money. Um, I, I think I'd be happy to know that this thing is real and it does exist. Um, if it was found to be a real animal or was um, discovered live or dead, and then they came out in the, in the news and, and made a big to-do about it, I don't know how I'd really feel about it from that point. Um, I'd probably just keep doing what I'm doing because I'd want to learn more about it now that I know that it's real. And that would probably, unfortunately, probably intensify my, my study of it. Because I want to be able to see it in its own natural habitat and learn its its true behaviors and where how it how it's been able to elude us and be so elusive for the past hundred plus years and, and just there'd be so many more questions than answers if we did discover it and uh, you know I, I think I'd just be happy to have a little bit of closure. Well, this has been freaking awesome. So I really appreciate you taking the time. I've missed you, my friend. Um, I'm glad to hear your voice. I'm, I was glad to talk mountain monsters with you again. I miss you. <laughs> oh, I miss you too, Marie. And um, the end of our show, I always say the, the, uh, the prayer of protection. So I'm going to go ahead and do that now. The light of God surrounds us. The love of God enfolds us. The power of God protects us. The presence of God watches over us. Wherever we are, God is. Amen. Thanks again, Eric, for joining us tonight. And thank you all for tuning in to Macabre Moments. Um, and until the next episode, stay scared.